Hello, hello, hello. Um, this was requested. This is going to be my Mike Oldfield primer. So hang on to your hats. We're going to go through this one at a time. Um, before we go on to his main discography, you might want to check out his work with his sister. He did an album called um, Children of the Sun with his previous group called the Sally Angie um, with his um, sister Sally Oldfield back in the late 60s. I think it was 69. It's a very twee folk outfit, but one for those of you who want to investigate. Um, he also worked with um, Kevin Ayers on um, is it Shooting at the Moon? That sounds about right, doesn't it? I'm sure someone will, will, will correct me. Um, but yeah, he was Mike, uh, Mike Oldfield was uh, Kevin Ayers' bassist for a while. Before he did Tube of the Bells. Now, what's to be said about Tube of the Bells that hasn't been said before? It's an epic piece, great starting point, blah, 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 blah. For me, it's a little bit overplayed. I've you know, heard it a lot. But again, essential. If you want to get the best version, buy the one that was out recently, 2008, I think it was. No, 2009, my mistake, because you can get a surround sound version of that. Uh, 1974, Hergis Ridge. Well, I think it's probably one of his more overlooked albums now. Um, I like it, it's very pastoral. There are a variety of mixes to choose from. I'll probably do a special about it to come, so I'm not going to dwell on it, but it's one of my favourites. This is followed by Omadorn, 1975. Omadorn, you get a slightly different move uh, from Oldfield. You have more um, ethnic influences, lots of African drummer in it. Absolutely great piece of music. I really like Omadorn, probably over Tubular Bells. So there you go. Then in 78 we have Incantations. Um, this is after he's done his exegesis um, course and had his mind deconstructed and reconstructed again. And it shows musically. It's very different to what's gone before. It's very mechanical. I think some of the passion and some of the the delicacy has is, is, is been lost. That's just my opinion. It's a good album, but you know... I like it when it's a bridge. I like the you know the the high wath a bit, and that's just about it for me. It's a bit of a it goes on a bit, but the live DVD of it, Mike Oldfield exposed um, DVD is pretty good if you want to see it. Uh, 1979 Platinum. Uh, I've already done a review of this. Um, yeah, so click my hand. 1980 QE2. I've already done a review of this as well, so uh, click my hand. Yeah. Um, then we get to 1982, five miles out. It, again, it's very much an extension of what's gone before on QE2. You have some, you know, a lot of instrumental pieces. There's a couple of um, songs on there. Five miles out itself is the big hit. Yeah, for me, it's one of his last good ones. So you know, I like it. It's a good one. Uh, crisis. This is where things start to get a little bit, mm, a little bit iffy. Um, yeah, you got one side of it is Crisis, which is a long, long piece of music. It's okay. It's all right. You get the hit on side two, Moonlight Shadow. God, I remember when that was a hit. I remember hearing that on holiday when I was a little boy. Um, In high places, John uh, John Anderson, um, and the. Awful Shadow on the Wall by Roger Chat with Roger Chapman from Family singing on. Oh, yeah. So there you go. <laughs> um, then we're on to Discovery again, one of his weaker albums. You know, we had the singles to France, which was a big hit at the time, and some. I mean. I start losing interest around this time, so I'm sure there are some of you that like it. I think The Lake is probably the the standout track um, there. Uh, Killing Fields is a soundtrack. It's a soundtrack. It's all very good. It's very it's, it's an evocative, evocative um, piece. Etude is the hit from it. But again, it's not one of Oldfield's songs. It's actually a cover, but been rearranged by him. You know, it's okay if you like listening to soundtracks. 1987, um, we have Islands, and we see a marked, a real marked change for Oldfield here. Um, we have The Wind Chimes Part 1 and 2, which is again a long, sprawling piece. Doesn't do anything for me. Um, on the B side, you have a load of, a load of songs. Um, Bonnie Tyler guests on it. 
uh, Nita Hegel and Jim Price, but most importantly, Kevin Ayres. Oh yeah, Kevin Ayres makes a guest appearance on a uh, flying start, and it's all about hitting the booze. And the video, if you ever see the video, is is quite good or quite sad as well, because you know Kevin Ayres had a bit of a, a drink problem. Well, he probably doesn't think it's a problem, but <laughs> you know, I find it quite a strange song to be sung by Kevin Ayres. Uh, Earth moving. Oh god, it is appalling. Oh, I can't stand it. It's a terrible album. Um, I think Adrian Ballou appears on Holy, I believe. And apart from that, it's yeah, blooming awful. Don't like that one. Nineteen ninety, the probably one of the one of his best albums, Amarok. Um, it's sixty minutes exactly. Well, it used to be sixty minutes on the CD version I had of pure instrumental. It's a, it's an unofficial follow up to Omadorn. It's absolutely crazy bonkers. It's moving in all sorts of directions at once. He he recorded it as a as a kind of a thumb a finger up to Richard Branson and to the radio stations. So no, no, there wasn't anything on it that you could actually play on the radio because it's all these little short bits of music. It's absolutely amazing. The only downside is it's got this awful, unfunny Maggie Thatcher, Janet Brown um, imitation at the end, uh, which I don't really... It doesn't work. I thought it was a load of old rubbish, but um, apart from that, the rest of it is absolutely fantastic. I used to spend loads of time laying on the bed listening to that when it came out. Uh, Evans Open awful this is his contractual breakup album with virgin records um and uh it's it, it it's a, it really is a bad 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 music from the balcony um features i think courtney pine the the well-known saxophonist it's quite quite all right and his final parting words is you hear oldfield saying fuck off <laughs> to Virgin Records and Richard Branson, which is nice, isn't it? And that's it. 1992, Tubular Bells 2. Again, what's there to be said? It's a, a pastiche of the original one. It was good fun at the time, but as time has passed, I've kind of fallen out of love with it. But, you know, what can you do? Uh, 1994, Songs of Distant Earth. Now, this is quite an unusual one because it's kind of based on... Uh, work uh, the work of Arthur C. Clarke and I quite like this one it's kind of ambient there's lots of quotes and things going on there I really enjoyed it at the time yeah I, mean, I haven't listened to it in a few years but I remember really really enjoying it and uh, yeah 1996 Voyager oh god it's awful you just have to look at the album cover to realise just how awful it was. I mean, I don't know if he was doing a <laughs> something. Not that, not that I'm suggesting that Mike Oldfield. Um, <laughs> I'm just saying you'd need to <laughs> to um, to do that kind of album cover. You know, well, you'd have to pay me to <laughs> do that album cover. I might have to censor this bit for legal reasons. So if there's a lot of quacking, it's because I've censored it for legal reasons. Oh dear. Next. Uh, 1998, Tubular Bells 3, and Mike Oldfield is living on Ibiza and being influenced by Spanish guitar and dance music, and Tubular Bells 3 is the result. Uh, I like The Serpent's Dream, and that's about it really. The rest of it is, it's alright. It doesn't deserve the Tubular Bells 3 moniker though, it could have been released as something else. Man in the Rain is just an absolute rip-off of Moonlight Shadow. It's unbelievable. You won't you wouldn't believe it. Um now, 1999, guitars. I have a real soft spot for this because I remember when it came out, I bought it in um I bought it in Virgin Records in Norwich. Yes. There you go. And um it's just him and guitars, various guitars, um, no drums at all. It's it's just him and the guitars going back to basics. And I really like it. I think it's a really great record. Um there's also some Roland MIDI guitar synth stuff going on there as well, so that, that appeals to me. Um, but I think it's just an absolute great record, one of my favourites. Uh, oh, God. 1999, The Millennium Bell. Uh, 
2002 Trey Luna. Yeah, kind of goes a bit um, um, goes a bit dancey again. His sister does some speaking on it. Um, yeah, I didn't think much of it. Uh, 2003 Tuba Bells 2003. Now, this is a curious one. Oldfield decides to completely re-record Tubular Bells, but using digital technology. And the resulting thing is something that is absolutely soulless and awful. But by all means, pick it up. It's absolutely awful. Uh, let's see. Uh, light and Shade. Sorry, it, it, it didn't work for me. And that's why it came, it came in at 175 on the UK chart. Uh, music of the Spheres. Uh, Mike Alford goes classical. That's interesting enough. You know, it, it's all right. It's not brilliant, but he does um, does classical music. Um, so that's it. So those are the studio albums of Mr. Oldfield. Um, ones to get, obviously the first the first three. They're pretty much essential. Tuba Bells, Huggis Ridge, Omadorn. I've got a soft spot for Platinum and QE2, and then uh, let's see, and Moroccan guitars. That's it. And with that, I'm signing off. My name's been Darren Locke. This has been my Mike Oldfield Primer. Hope you've enjoyed it. Only one more thing to say. Prog on. Did it within 12 minutes. Feeling pretty chuffed with myself. Ta-da.